Shri Tripura Rahasyam Mahatmya Khandam Aum Shri Ganesha Sharada Guru Bhyo Namaha Namaste. Welcome to the continuation of our series on Sri Tripura Rahasya Mahatmya Khanda. Now, why is this scripture important? It really doesn't have a whole lot of content that's different from, say, the Devi Bhagavata. But it's important because it is the first book of this secretive scripture. Huh? Rahasya means secret. And Tripura literally means three cities. But it can also mean the three worlds, Bhur, Bhuva, and Swa. And finally, it can mean the three states of consciousness, waking, dreaming, and sleeping. So, Goddess Tripura is not the goddess of, but she actually is directly all these things. She is the cosmic manifestation. So it's very important that we worship her to accumulate sufficient pious credits or punya to be successful in the quest for self-realization. She also automatically increases the quality of life of her devotees. So their health, intelligence, wealth, and so on, just automatically improve. Why is that? Because we're honoring the duality. We're honoring Maya, the manifestation. And Brahman with qualities, huh? Saguna Brahman, is just as important as Brahman without qualities, Nirguna Brahman. And these are personified as Shiva and Shakti. So worshiping Shiva without worshiping Shakti, <laughs> we're missing half or more than half because in our unenlightened state, she is everything that we perceive. And only in the higher stages of the path do we come directly in contact with Shiva or pure awareness, unconditioned consciousness. So in this sense, this scripture is very important. And in another sense as well, previous to this series, the only known edition of Tripura Rahasya in, Eng in English was the edition published by Raman Ashramam, which contained only the Jnana Khanda. The Jnana Khanda is the third book. The second book, the Madhyama Khanda, has been lost. And the first book, the Mahatmya Khanda, was available in India in Sanskrit only. So most people didn't understand that before you can jump into the Jnana Khanda, you have to have the preliminaries of the Mahatmya Khanda and the Madhyama Khanda, which, when it was available, gave instructions for the sadhana to lead up to Jnana Khanda. So without Mahatmya Khanda, we're lost. And we can make do without the Madhyama Khanda because those instructions for sadhana are also in many other books in the Sri Vidya lineage. So the point is, we cannot just jump into meditation. We cannot just enter the high realms of Jnana Khanda or Jnana Yoga without sufficient preparation. And those who do fall down. They also lose the benefits that they might collect 
by worshiping Shakti because they offend her. They don't give her sufficient honor and sufficient puja and prayers before they try to create an intimate relationship with her in jnana. So, up until now has been the preliminary part of the book. And you can see the previous series here. So now we really come to the heart, uh, which is the instructions of Dattatreya Guru to Parashuram. And as we pick up the story, Parashuram has arrived at Dattatreya's ashram. And he is thinking to himself, while surveying the strange scene that he encounters. Parashuram saw that great personality, Guru Dattatreya, who was brilliant, a paragon whose hue was like the blue stem of a tender sprout of tamal tree, whose eyes were like a fully blossomed lotus, whose face was like the full moon, and whose lips were shining like fresh coral the beauty of whose tender smile illuminated the quarters, whose rows of teeth defeated the glow of big pearls, whose face was shining with broad cheeks and nose, whose neck was like a conch, who was shining with beautiful long arms, whose palm was soft like new sprouts, who was robust and full-chested, whose stomach had three folds, whose thighs were beautiful like the trunk of an elephant, whose calves were similar to a quiver, whose feet were charming like a lotus. The mere sight of him who was the root of beauty, pure and youthful, kindled infinite love in women. So this is the description of an incarnation of Vishnu. How do we know this? Well, there are scriptures uh, Vedangas on physiognomy. Physiognomy describes the various characteristics of different classes of human beings. And the highest class, of course, is the divine incarnations. And they are, I mean, just inconceivably beautiful. No one can understand. This is like the template of the ideal human form. And when these incarnations appear, they demonstrate these qualities that are narrated in this verse. So the point is that an incarnation of God is all attractive. Uh, he attracts men with his power and wisdom and fairness, open-mindedness, open-heartedness, purity, and so on. And he attracts women with his incredible good looks, <laughs> among all the other qualities. So this, we should understand, is the evidence presented in the Shastra of the incarnation of God. His arms, for example, are so long that they reach down to his knees. His feet are marked with the, the lines of a lotus, a rod, a bow, an elephant, and many other significant uh, structures. The palms of his hands are also marked with auspicious lines. And he has three lines in his neck and in his stomach. So these are to be understood as phys physiognomical characteristics of the Supreme Personality, the Incarnation, the Avatar. Parashuram, from these signs, knows, he recognizes that this is not an ordinary person. This is this most superior type of human being. Seeing such an ascetic who was embraced by some young beautiful woman equaling Lakshmi with reddish eyes rolling due to intoxication, and with a wine pitcher in front, exhibiting contradictory signs, Parashuram became suspicious. He thought, 
What is this wonderful behavior of this great sage? I see his conduct like wine mixed with poison. Alas, in this world, the manner of great persons is extremely surprising. Sometimes they exhibit external goodness. Sometimes they display inner beauty. In this world, for persons like me, the behavior of yogis is indeed incomprehensible. That sage, Samvarta, would not tell me something that is useless. Also, how will such a tranquil person, the Brahmin, seek shelter at the doors of the hermitage? Again, many pious persons are sitting around him. Therefore, what I am seeing is not the reality, which is something else. Whatever it may be, this ancient person is my guru. Differences like good and bad are mental formations. Oh, this is deep. <laughs> See, the, these scriptures in Sri Vidya are so wonderful because they embrace the totality of the Vedic teaching. Huh? Not only karma yoga, but all the way up through jnana yoga and beyond uh, to the ajatta point of view. So here we see a, not only a sage, but an incarnation displaying apparently contradictory symptoms. He is supposed to be the, the emblem or the symbol of Vedic wisdom. And yet here he's sitting with a girl on his lap and drinking wine. <laughs> he ought to know he has so many girlfriends. <laughs> So anyway, at first, Parashuram is bewildered, but then he remembers Samvarta. Remember back in the beginning, Parashuram met Samvarta, who is a realized being. And Samvarta is speaking on the Ajatta platform. And Parashuram could tell there was something special about him, but he couldn't really understand his teaching. So finally, Samvarta said, just go and see Dattatreya. He'll take care of you. So after a long journey, now Parashuram is showing up at Dattatreya's hermitage. And he sees there's a nice Brahmin at the entrance. And inside, there are so many pious, advanced souls uh, keeping his company. And yet, and yet, <laughs> He can't reconcile this evidence with the fact that he's sitting with a girl and drinking wine. So the point here is that those who are fully self-realized, like Samvarta or Dattatreya, or really anyone who's self-realized, is not covered by the rules and regulations of karma yoga. Even those who are real bhakta yogas, uh, they're, they're not covered by the rules and regulations. They have much greater freedom. They can do pretty much whatever they want within the bounds of their transcendental relationship with their deity, their ishta devata. This is a, a very subtle message for those who know. And for those who don't know, it's a riddle. How is it possible? Deciding thus, the intelligent Parashuram stood there with a calm mind. Seeing the polite Bhargava, the guru spoke sweet words carrying wonderful meaning. O oh, Parashuram, welcome to you. Are you fine? In your hermitage are the Brahmins, cows, grass, creepers, and trees doing well? Are you serving your visitors properly? Are oblations to fire suitably given? O oh, Brahmarshi, are the Vedas being studied from time to time? Are you without delay keeping under control the untimely upsurge of the enemies in the body, the senses? By merits of your penance, you have conquered many worthy worlds. The Bhargava lineage has indeed risen to the acme by your penance, erudition, power, continence, and luster. 
Tell me why you have come. Persons like me are not to be sought by sacred men. It just gets deeper and deeper. <laughs> this is the kind of welcome that is offered by a realized soul. He wants to see if the person approaching him is actually qualified. Has he actually got it together? Is he neglecting any area of his life? Or does he have well-rounded realization and activity? And finally, the last line is the punchline, where he says, uh, you shouldn't approach me because I am not pure. I am not pious. What are you doing coming to me? Because I am not a person to be approached by sacred people. To put it the other way around, if you feel you're sacred, if you feel that you're pure, if you feel that you're Brahminical and Vedic and all that, why are you approaching me? I'm beyond all that. I don't care a fig for all these religious rules and regulations. I'm simply enjoying life. Huh? So why would you want to approach me if you're after religious credits, if you're after reputation and the praise of ordinary men? Why would you approach me? You've already conquered the higher planets with your sadhana and your puja. Huh? and your great sacrifice in controlling the debased kshatriyas who murdered your father. So why are you coming to me? You've already attained all the objects of religion. And so I'm beyond all that. I don't care about that. So what do you want with me? And he continues. In this world, conquering the senses is responsible for attaining the four goals. Attainment of the four goals is considered to be the highest gain in this world. Those persons without reaching the four goals who are engaged in mercenary activities are like breathing dead bodies. Thus, those men who are interested in wealth are like wooden puppets engaged in futile activities. Earlier, due to utter dispassion, I discarded all action. Among the enemies of the self, the tongue and the procreative organ are powerful. Many have been degraded by them. He who has conquered these two has truly conquered everything. I am really despicable, for I have both such weaknesses. Pious persons do not follow me who has taken to the forbidden path. This wine which causes mental disorder is reproached by the pious, similarly a courtesan. I have taken to both of these. Therefore, pious persons have perhaps gone away from my company. Hence, how have you come to such a place as this? O oh, Bhargava, tell me the truth by which my mind gets clarified. So, of course, the four goals are Dharma, Artha, Kama, and Moksha. Religious piety, wealth, sense enjoyment, and liberation. These really sum up the goals and purposes of human life in just four words. So the point is, those who are religious, those who are pious, are striving for these four goals. But those who are realized are beyond them. They don't care about them because they well know that all these things are simply temporary. And because of that, they're not worth going after. That's why he says people who are striving after these things are like breathing dead bodies. Huh? They're dead, though alive, because they have no spiritual life. They have no goal that is beyond. Uh, he says, I have given up all actions. So as soon as he relinquishes, relinquishes actions, He's also given up the goals. Because why do we act huh? if not to attain them? So this is the welcome <laughs> given by Dattatreya to Parashuram. He's testing him. 
He wants to see if he actually understands the difference between religious advancement and actual self-realization. Aum Tat Sat. Aum Shakti Aum.